things are made new Surrendered my life to Christ I'm moving, moving What a moment You brought me to such freedom I found in you, you're the healer who makes all things new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going back, I'm moving on, yeah. I'm here to give back to you. My past is over in you. Things are made. Good to be in the Lord's house this morning. By way of announcement, today we have choir practice at 4 o'clock. Band needs to be here at 5. Prayer in the sanctuary at 5 30. Men, don't forget we're meeting at Pastor's office. Uh, don't forget prayer meeting tomorrow night at 7. Tuesday's ladies' meeting at 6 30. There's a sign up sheet for the welcome desk. Don't forget Wednesday night service at 7. Uh, Friday, the kids and the youth are going bowling. We're going to be here at the church at 6 o'clock. And Saturday's motorcycle finishing meeting at 7. I want to thank everybody who helped and all who supported the Apple Festival. And don't forget, next Sunday starts our revival with Brother Gerald Gibson. This is September 29th through October the 4th. There's going to be a baby shower on October the 5th with Jeremy and Christy Middleton. That's where the little girl is. It's 11 to 1. Everyone is invited to this. Good morning. 
She's laid them on the altar. They're praying with her about it. Now, I want us to bind together right now and bind this addiction that's on her that God would just break it off her completely. Father, in the name of Jesus, we proclaimed it Wednesday night that you nailed those sins to your cross. And, Father, we just declare right now freedom and liberty over Ashley. God, that you're going to completely set her free and deliver her, God. Father, she has brought these things to this altar, and she is declaring and proclaiming, God, that she's going to be free from these. And, Father, we just bind with her right now. You tell us in your word, God, that you've given us the keys of the kingdom. Whatever we bind shall be bound. Whatever we loose shall be loosed. And Father, we bind this addiction right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare freedom and liberty for my sister right now in the name of Jesus. Father, there are a lot of concerns that she has. And I pray, God, that you would take all those fears away. Those fears of what if. God, I pray that you take those away. God, that she could be at complete liberty and freedom, God, to be able to walk in what you've called her to walk in. Father, we bind this enemy right now. Devil, quit lying to her. Quit trying to make her believe this or that. God, we come against it right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare freedom and liberty over Ashley. And Father, I pray, God, that you would give her strength to begin to walk in the freedom that you've declared in her life. To begin to walk in the liberty, God, that you've declared over her. That was Jesus has already done through the cross that set her free. He that the Son has set free shall be free indeed. And Father, we declare freedom over her. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Father, we bless your name tonight. We thank you today, God, for what you're going to do and what you've done, Lamb of God. We just praise you right now in the name of Jesus. We're believing it. We're calling it done by faith. 
God, we're walking by faith and declaring it by faith that what you declare in your word, it is done. It is done in the name of Jesus. It is done. And we just proclaim liberty right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, folks. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in his house tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you today. 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 Come on, folks. Be done with them. Be done with them. Come on, folks. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, would you? Put them on that altar. Done. Done. Now praise Him. Now praise Him. Father, we thank you for freedom. We thank you for liberty. Woo! Glory to God. I feel you in this house this morning, God. Praise your holy name. Father, sanctify it by faith, God, because she trusts you to see her through this adversity. Since 11 years old, God, she's been smoking these things. And, Father, she has declared that they're nasty and that she doesn't want them anymore. And, Father, she surrenders them to you. Devil, take your hand off her thoughts. Take your hand off her thoughts. I declare liberty in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He that the Son is set free is free indeed. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. One more time, church. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah.
Trace, will you pull up Colossians chapter 3 for me? I want to read this scripture. Actually, I want you to pay close attention to the scripture, honey, but I want, I want everybody to listen to what Paul is saying to the Colossian church here. I'm not preaching on this this morning, but God just dropped this scripture in my spirit. Colossians chapter 3, we're going through verse 17. Folks, God's working in this house in somebody's life right now. You need to allow him to do what he wants to do in your heart right now, what he wants to do in your life. Don't miss this moment with God. The Bible said that with two or three gathered his name, he's in the midst. God is here. He's ministering to somebody. Now, if you're not getting it, then that's, that's between you and him. Somebody's getting touched by God right now. I believe that. You ready, Trace? Go ahead and pull that first verse, please. Colossians 3, chapter 3. Went the wrong way. That's all right. Let me read it. It says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. He said, set your th heart on things above, not on things of this earth. You are dead, for your life is hid in Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Kill them. You kill them through him. Your life is in him. You're dead. But your life is in him. Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. Every one of us have lived in this place at one time or another. And God said that the wrath of his wrath will fall on those that walk in these things. And you walked in them at some time. But now, you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, hum humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Put these things on, he says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ has forgave you, so also do ye. 
I know I wasn't preaching on this morning, but I'm telling you, that'll preach right there. If Christ is forgiving you, we also should forgive one another. Mm. All right. <laughs> and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Paul tells them in the Corinthians, the Corinthian chapter, in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, you can do all these things, but if you don't have charity, it's nothing. Sounding brass, tinkling cymbal. Look, you can dress up, look right, act right, but if you don't have love, it's not, he said, put on charity. It's the bond. It's what holds all this together is love. By this shall they know that you're my disciples. You have love toward one another. It's the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Ashley, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. You are dead. Your life is not in those cigarettes. Your life is not in what the devil's trying to lie to make you fit a mold that you'll look a certain way or act a certain way so that you'll please people. You are to please Him. And when you set your affection on Him, it won't matter what other people think about you. That goes for everybody in here. When you are looking to Him and your affection is on Him and you realize I am dead in Him and He is my life, then what people's opinions are doesn't really matter because it's all about Him. You are risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above. God wants us to look to Him. Put off the things of the earth. Put on the things of the Spirit and allow God to be God in our life. Amen. Would you just stretch your hands up toward heaven and just worship Him for just a moment. Thank Him for what He's doing. Thank Him for what He's doing. Father, we worship You today. We worship You today. Come on, so just thank God. Just for just a moment, would you set your affection on things above? Don't worry about what you got to do this afternoon. Don't worry about what's coming tomorrow. Don't worry about what's going on around you right now. But for just this moment, would you realize that you are dead and that you are alive in Christ and just worship Him for just a moment? God, is in this place to minister to somebody. Shake off heavy bands. Break off chains. Let God do in your life what only He can do for this moment right here. God is causing you to become new. He's causing somebody to become new. You are new in Him. Your life is in Him. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank You today. We thank You today. We thank You today. God, that there is a distinct purpose that you have for us, an expected end for our life. We worship you today. We worship you today. We worship you today. Father, you are a good God. You're a good God. You're a good God. We worship you today. We worship you today, Father. You are worthy. You are worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Jesus. Declare that bridge with the singers. Come on, declare that bridge right now. Come on, singers, sing it. Come on, just keep worshiping for a moment. Come on, think about it. Son of the living Match God right now for just a moment. Everywhere wonderful. Just picture him. Sing it to him. Beautiful.
Devil, I want you to hear our declaration today that there is no one like our Jesus. You have tried and tried and tried, but I want to declare today that in Him, we've been made more than a conqueror, and you lose. Today, devil, we put you on notice that you lose because Jesus has given us the victory. We declare it today that our God is wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless. There is no God like our God. We declare it today. We worship you today. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> and I just want to tell you right now, devil, you've tried to distract me with problems that are going on in this building, but you've lost. I'm more in tune right now than I've been all day long. Devil, you lose. You lose. You hear me? You lose. Because greater is he that is in me than he is in this world. You lose, devil. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. several weeks the liberty and the opportunity that we have right now happened because somebody died and because he died we die but because he lives we live <laughs> Woo. I like the way Paul put it I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ lives in me. Thank God that I've got liberty and peace of mind and freedom because of what He's done in me and because He died. Look, I look around, folks. We've been vacuuming up water. There's water dripping up here, but we can't get distracted by that kind of stuff because the devil would love to get our mind off of the things that God is trying to do. The devil is a liar. The devil is a loser. The devil is defeated, and we overcome because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the death that was sacrificed on that cross. I'm telling you, we overcome. We ought to declare liberty and freedom because He lives today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, guys. Our children's church can be dismissed at this time. While they're being dismissed, let me say to you, this morning, I will preach the greatest message of my career. Today, I'm going to join with thousands of pastors across this United States and this globe and we will preach the greatest message of our career. There's no other message like the one that I will preach to you today. This morning, I will be joined by you in proclaiming the greatest message ever declared in all of the earth. An unusual feature of this preaching is that I and other preachers and other congregations will have the opportunity to do this without saying a word because we can declare today and proclaim the death of a risen Savior but proclaim the death of Christ the most beautiful love story ever known to man is that a man would die for somebody like me wow what a story. One 
movie writer put it this way, the greatest love story ever told. That a man named Jesus would leave the portals of heaven and the beautiful, beautiful glory that he was able to behold and come and dwell amongst men and die. I want to read this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. If you would stand, if you're not already standing, I appreciate it for the honor of God's word this morning. Paul said, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Tonight, we'll take communion. Tonight, without uttering a word, we'll show forth the Lord's death and proclaim the greatest message ever preached. Folks, you need to understand that this is what it's all about. Because if this had not happened, None of this would have been possible. A man had to die. And I don't want us to ever forget that Jesus Christ hung on a bloody cross, sacrificed his life. He said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down myself. Don't ever forget the climax of this glorious gospel that a man died that blood might be shed for the remission of your sins. It's the greatest message ever preached. Father, help me today. Help me to do what you call me to do to minister this word. I pray, God, that we would leave this place a little more appreciative, a little more understanding, God. God, I just want to say right now that stuff we face and things we go through Things that bother us, things that trouble us, things that get us stressed out. None of that really compares to what you went through to take our place. The horrificness of the death of the cross. And Father, that is what the church should be proclaiming to the lost. Is that a man died that they might have life. And he now lives that we may live also. Father, would you give me my picture back? I lost focus. I've gotten so caught up in all this other stuff going on and so stressed about this, that, and the other. God, that my picture of Christ hanging on the cross is it's not at the forefront of my mind, but God, I want to bring it back. God, I want you to bring it to the forefront of everybody's mind that's here today of a bloody cross and a bloody Savior beaten and battered and bruised for us. It's so easy to get wrapped up in life, in what we call life, that we forget so often, Lord, that the only reason we have life is because your Son died. Help us today. I love you. I praise you. I give you the glory and the honor. Please forgive us. For times we've trampled underfoot the precious blood of the Lamb. We die to you, God. I love you. I praise you. I give you the glory and the honor. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11 the Bible says you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes that word show means to proclaim or to preach so every time you or I or any other person takes of the communion those that are saved we should be preaching the death of the Lord Jesus Christ 
should be something that we never forget. It should be something that we would always understand. It's so easy in life to get so wrapped up in this problem and this concern and this activity and this, this uh, you know, uh, situation or these circumstances. It's so easy to get wrapped up in that. But sometimes I believe God needs to bring our focus back to what really matters. Because we get so tripped up over the smallest of things and forget that a man died. We should proclaim that. We should understand that. We should preach that. We should preach our faith to others. We should let them know, listen, it could be worse. It's, it has been worse, and it's been worse for others. And let them know that, that, that through our preaching and through our proclaiming that our own personal faith in the death of our Savior, that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. It only makes sense that we remind ourselves that's exactly what we're preaching about when we proclaim the death of Christ. One of the great scriptures which describes this death so vividly is Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to go through that scripture today, and we'll probably go through it again tonight if the Lord allows us to do so. But I want to back up for just a moment and let you know that Isaiah is writing in about 700 B.C. So all this is going on. All these things are being said hundreds of years before the event actually took place. What the Lord did was in fulfillment of this and other prophecies. Let's go through a couple of things this morning. According to Isaiah 53, to proclaim the death of Christ is to preach his rejection. Verse 3 says he is despised and rejected of men. The word despised means to be thought little of. Here was the very Son of God who was despised and rejected of men. He was despised enough to be betrayed by his own friend. He was despised enough to be given a mock trial instead of a fair trial. He was despised enough to be mocked and spit upon and beaten. He was despised enough to be forced into carrying his own cross as far as he, he was able to carry it. But not only was Jesus despised, but he was rejected. Israel as a nation had rejected Christ, had turned their back on the Messiah, the very one that they were looking for, but they despised him and they rejected him. And most of all, the people within the nation also rejected him. The Bible tells us in John 1.11 that he came unto his own and his own received him not. Today, the same thing is happening. He is despised, he's rejected by people who do not want him as their Lord and Savior. In his day, Jesus was despised and rejected of men. In our day, Jesus is still despised and rejected by men. The question is, is has Jesus been despised and rejected by you? Are you here this morning and not accepted him? Because not to accept him is to reject him. You can't be neutral about Jesus. Either you're going to serve him or you're not. You can't sit here and say, well, I'm not really living for him, but at the same time, I'm not against him. The Bible said in Luke 11 and 23, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. You have to know today, are you on the Lord's side? Are you sold out completely to him? Otherwise, you are rejecting him and casting him off. Again, in Isaiah 53 and 3, the Bible said that he was a man of sorrows. The Lord knew what it was to have friends to forsake him. At one point, he had 5,012 men plus women and children standing on a mountainside with him, and he began to declare the authority of God's word. While he was declaring it, he took fish and broke it and fed them and took care of them. But then he began to declare the word of the Lord. And the Bible said that he looked at them and said, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no part in me. 5,000 people at one moment left and turned went back home and said, no, I'm not having any of this. He knew what it was to be a man of sorrows. He knew what it was to be rejected and despised. He knew what it was to be forsaken. The Lord knew what it was to pour out his heart all night in prayer, knowing that in just a few short hours, he would be unfairly crucified on the cross. He knew what it was to be praying in that garden and asking three of his closest friends, can you pray with me for one hour? I'm about to go through one of the most horrific moments in my life, and I'm just wanting you to pray with me for one hour. He would come back after his hour of prayer and find them sleeping, and he says to them, Come on, can you not pray with me just one hour? He went away, come back, found them sleeping again. He said, Sleep on, my hour's come. 
went and prayed again, spent time praying until his sweat became his drops of blood, intensely praying because he knew that the seriousness of the moment that was about to occur, he knew what was about to happen. The Bible said in Isaiah 53, he was acquainted with grief. This acquaintance with grief makes him the ideal Savior. He knew what it was. He did not sit in heaven and joyfully announce, I'll sit up here and save you. Instead, he left the glory of heaven and put himself on a, in a place of a man and experienced the same sorrows that we do. The writer of Hebrews said, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was acquainted with grief. In order to save us, he had to experience even greater sorrows. It says, and we hid it, hid as, our, as it were our faces from him. We, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. For all his sufferings, and all the hardship, and all that he went through, the Israelites wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And the same is true today. The world doesn't really want him. The world really doesn't want him. They, they, listen. Let me, let me take it a little bit closer. People within the church don't really want him. As, as an old movie that I wouldn't recommend you watching, as an old movie said, you can't handle the truth. The church today can't handle the truth. They don't want to live and abide within the truth. They want the idea of Christianity, but they don't want the mandates of Christianity. They want the idea of Christ, but they don't want to die in Christ. Because to die in Christ means i got to put myself down, and I've got to die in Him, and I can't have what I want. I must want what He wants for me to have. See, it's suffering. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. For all that Jesus went through to offer eternal life, people hide their faces for Him despise him and show no respect. So to, so to preach or declare or proclaim the, 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 the gospel of Christ or the death of Christ, you must preach his rejection, but you also must preach his bearing of my sin. He took my sin. The Bible said in Isaiah 53 and 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Notice, he bore my griefs. And he carried our sorrows. Why are you carrying something he's already carried for you? Why are you bearing something he's already bore for you? Why are you hanging on to stuff? Since you said it, Wednesday night I should have came up here and gave him up. But for the last four days, you've still been bearing something he already bore for you. That's what the scripture said. Why are we bearing things that he's already bore? Why are we carrying things that he's already carried? In Him is peace. In Him is life. In Him is solace. In Him is joy. We can have those things when we abide in Him, but yet we walk around stressed out. I'm saying we because I'm pointing at me. We walk around stressed out, burdened, overwhelmed. I mean, all these things are going on in our life when He's already took care of those things for us. The Bible said that if we'll cast all our care upon Him, He cares for us. We can be free. So what causes grief today? What causes sorrows? If we had time, we could trace back every grief, every sorrow to one three-letter word, sin. He bore our sins, folks. He took those sins and nailed them to the cross, paid an eternal sacrifice that all you have to do is accept by faith and declare and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Folks, I'm not here to preach you some theologically deep message today. It's a very simple message that he died and bore what you couldn't bear, suffered in a way you couldn't suffer, and said, here, I've done it. Take life and run with it. Have it more abundant. <laughs> See, it's all about sin. Think about it. Before man sinned, there was no sickness. Before man sinned, there was no natural calamities. Before man sinned, there was no death. Before man sinned, there was no heartache. There was no grief. It was a utopia. It was beautiful. God looked down upon the creation and said, It is good. 
And if he, being a perfect God, looked down and declared something to be good, you ought to know it was good. So in order for us to have eternal life, that's life of no death, no heartache, no grief, no calamities, no sickness. Someone had to bear away the sin. There was only one that could have done that. His name was Jesus. Notice something, that when God sent someone to bear the sin, that he did not send an angel. Neither did he send a common man. Instead, God sent his own son, God himself, wrapped in the flesh to take care of the problem. Verse 4, look at it. It gives an ironic twist. It said, after he did all this, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. See, this was the attitude of the Jewish rulers who had Jesus nailed to the cross. They accused Jesus of blasphemy because he said that he was the Son of God. Look at what Luke says in Luke 23 about the crucifixion. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And when the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. Right here, Isaiah's prophecy is coming true. He's bearing the sin. He's bearing the grief. He's bearing the sorrows. He's carrying those things. And while he's in the midst of it, they're mocking him. They're laughing at him. They're riding him. And what did he do? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, boy, could, couldn't, we, couldn't we stand to have a little bit more Jesus? Could, couldn't we stand to be just a little bit more like him? I, I, couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't it be nice if, if people could just see him in us when the world has thrown everything they can at us and they're still laughing at us? We're on our deathbed. They're trying to tell us how bad we are. They're trying to tell us how worthless we are. But yet we look at them out of love and mercy and compassion and declare, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Wouldn't it be nice to have just a little bit more Jesus in our life? Oh, Lord, help me today. See, you got to preach his rejection. you got to preach the fact that he bore my sins. If you're going to really proclaim the death of Christ, you also must preach his substitution. Isaiah 53 and 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Think about this for a moment. His wounds... They put him on that whipping post and they beat him within an inch of his life. They ripped flesh. They ripped meat. They tore the skin out. His organs were literally visible as his flesh was ripped away. They used every torturous tool that you could imagine and whipped him until he was barely able to hold himself up. But yet the Bible said that those wounds were for our transgressions. He was wounded. Because humanity had fallen into sin. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Think about this for just a moment. What if you've done an idiotic thing in a store? And your wife or your kid was there with you. And all of a sudden the owner and the security guard of that store came over. And begin to wail on your wife or your kid or your husband because of what you did. We wouldn't like that too much. We wouldn't like the thought of that too much. As a matter of fact, we'd probably jump in and try to stop it, try to, try to make sure it didn't happen. We'd do everything we could because we're the one that committed an idiotic uh, 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 fallacy. We're the one that did it. We're the one that messed up. Why are we going to sit and watch our child get beat to pieces? Why are we going to watch this, uh, see our spouse get beat down the, that way? Because we made a mistake. We messed up. We made a bad choice. We did something we shouldn't have. Why are we going to sit there and watch somebody else suffer? But that's exactly what Christ did. He took the whipping for us when we were the ones that blew it. He did nothing. There was no guile found in him. He did not do anything out of the way. He did not commit sin. And yet he died because of the curse of sin. He did that, folks, so that you and I could live. He was bruised for your iniquities. 
the chastisement he received was so that you and I could have peace with God. They plucked his beard. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. They laughed at him. They railed on him. They bowed before him in mockery and said, Hail, King of the Jews. They put a nameplate over his head on the cross. Here is the King of the Jews. Made sure they put it in three languages so that everybody would be able to know exactly what it said. And he was chastised so that you and I could have peace with God. Now what does that say about that chastisement? What does that say about that bruising? What does that say about that wounding? When you and I discontinue walking in peace with God. What are we doing to a Savior? What are we doing to a Master? What are we doing to a Lord when we say, you know what? I'm just going to keep myself in array. I'm going to continue to bear my grief. I'm going to continue to carry my sorrow. I know you were wounded. I know you were bruised. I know you were chastised. And I know you did it for me. But I got this one, Lord. I don't need what you have to offer for me. What's that say about us? What does that do to him? We're walking around stressed out. We're walking around bombarded. We're walking around with all this stuff on us when Jesus already went through all this so that we could have peace with God. Those stripes that he bore on his back were so you could be healed, folks. Can I tell you today, those stripes were not born in vain. Amen. Some of you, God is healed, miraculously healed. And it was because of those stripes. Those stripes weren't in vain. That blood that was shed, it wasn't in vain. Every drop that fell and hit Calvary's hill was not in vain. Every tear that was cried, every pain that was felt, every wounding, every stripe on his back, every time those Roman soldiers would whip back with that whip and come back across his back, what they didn't realize was that cancer was being healed, that AIDS was being healed, that people were being set free. Every time a Roman soldier whipped him, deliverance was, my God, deliverance was coming. God was doing something in the midst of it. That Roman soldier thought that he was under the mandate of Caesar but what he was under the mandate of was the mandate of almighty God that the stripes that was on his back was to set men and women free the stripes the wounding, the bruises the chastisement was for you and I friend that you and I could be set free verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sheep wander off, folks. That's why shepherds have that big old stick with a hook in it. Because when they get out of line, they grab that hook and yank them back in line. Get them back in place. Sheep wander off. And Isaiah said, we've just like sheep. We wander off. And we do. We fall into the trap of sin. We fall into the potholes of the enemy. All of us have wandered astray. We leave the right path and we do what displeases God. No one is excluded. We've all like sheep gone astray. It says we have turned everyone to his own way. Now, folks, that's the true definition of sin right there. Yeah. We have turned everyone to his own way. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's sin, folks. That's it right there. The Bible said that we are not tempted of God, but we are, when we are tempted, we are drawn away of our own lust. We have everyone turned our own way. We go after what we want. We do what we want to do. We live how we want to live. And if nobody else like it, then fool you on them. Even God. I'll do what I want to do. I'll live how I want to live. And when I come in this church and I give my tithe and I lift my hands and I say a praise the Lord, then God, you owe me because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But Monday through Saturday is mine. I'll live how I want to live. Come on, folks. We've turned to our own way. And the Lord took that iniquity. God took that iniquity of every one of us and laid it upon the Son of God. Your hard-headedness, your, your rebellion. 
our hard-headedness, our rebellion. I don't want to feel like I'm preaching at you. I want to preach with you here a little bit. It, it's our iniquity. It's what we did. And God said, I'll lay it upon the Son of God. He didn't deserve it. He didn't ask for it. He didn't need it. He could have he just done what he did. He could have stayed up in the heavens. We could still come in here and sacrifice rams, bulls, and goats and try our best to achieve the law. But God said, there's a better way. And I'm sending my only begotten Son to die once and for all and wash all this away if they'll just accept him. See, that's sin. See, we don't sin because this fellow in a red asbestos suit with a pitchfork and a pointy tail comes up and goes, boo! Oh, I better sin. That's not the thing, folks. He don't walk up and say, hello, I'm the devil, let's sin. He's subtle. He makes us think that we want something or desire something. See, that's, that's where it's at. We sin when we seek to satisfy ourselves. We turn to our own way. It's going to feel good. It will. The Bible describes sin as that there's pleasure in it, but it's only for a season. Those things that you do that you shouldn't be doing, it feels good for a moment. Young people, those things that the other young people try to get you to do, it's just for a moment. It'll feel good for a little bit. I mean, folks, I'm telling you, Let's just try it just a little bit. Let's just, let's, just, let's just see how far we can go. And that's all the devil's trying to do is just be subtle enough to hook you and grab you and put a chokehold on you and snatch you into a life of sin and rip you away from the hands of God. Sin will put a gulf between you and God. You need to be careful of that. That guy in the red suit, we could turn down. You could tell him, no, I've submitted my life to God. I'm resisting you. You could turn him down. You could tell him, no, I, I, I've been guilty of sin, but our sins have been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has washed me. He has cleaned me. Though my sins were as scarlet, they should be whiter than snow. I declare today my freedom, my liberty, because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid for me. I know I blew it. I know I messed up. But today I confess it before the people of God and before the church of God and before the, the heavens of God. I declare today that Jesus Christ died for me. He has washed me, cleaned me, made me a new creation. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price and my declaration today is that the devil lost, Jesus won and I'm going to overcome through the glory of God. We're guilty. The Lord laid the iniquity of us all on him. See, if you're going to preach the death of Christ, you need to understand that he was your substitute. How important is it for you to have a substitute for your sin? See folks, if Jesus did not pay for your sins, You'd be judged and forced to pay for your own sin. Matthew 13, 49 and 50 says this, So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Folks, if Jesus did not die for your sin, you'd have to stand before God and justify your own sin. And there is no justification in ourselves. And you'd be condemned to an eternal flame of hell. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Mark 9, 44 describes a place as where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. God gave us a substitute. Today, I want to praise God for the substitute. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, the Bible said, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Folks, he took upon the sin for us that we could stand righteously before God. Thank God that he has separated us and that he has consecrated us and that he has paid the sacrifice that you and I might live. It is a substitutionary death. We should have died, but he died. We should have been crucified, but he was crucified. We should have been dead in hell, but he descended to hell and came out alive forevermore. Thank God that he did that for us. It was a substitutionary death. He did what should have been done to us. If you're going to preach the death of Christ, you've got to preach his burial. Isaiah 53, verse 9. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In his death, Jesus was assigned... To die with wicked men, criminals. A criminal's death would have meant that he had to have a criminal's grave, but he didn't. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. The reason? They found no violence, no deceit. Matter of fact, Pilate says, I find no, no cause to crucify this man. There's no just cause whatsoever. What you're trying to do here is wrong. 
Pilate washed his hands of it and said, I'm done. If you want to do it, you do it, but I'm not going to have any part to do with it. He didn't have to be buried in a criminal's grave. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. It was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the one who laid the Lord Jesus in his own new grave. Listen, I think that it's important to remember that being buried in a rich man's tomb that never been used, it would be very easy to confirm his death, burial, and especially his resurrection. No other person had been buried in this tomb, and the tomb was empty. Couldn't blame the bones on anybody else. It's a new grave. Couldn't hold any, couldn't, couldn't say, you know, that, that, that it was deficient or ineffective. It was a new grave. It was freshly hewn out. Joseph had already prepared it. God had prepared it through Joseph for Jesus. And when they come back and found the stone rolled away, the tomb was empty. Thank God. I'm telling you, he died, but he didn't die and stayed dead. He came out alive. Thank God that he is resurrected. If you're going to preach the death of Christ, you must also focus on the resurrection. Verse 10, look what it says in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand God was satisfied with the work of Jesus on the cross notice that God that because God was satisfied look what it says he shall prolong his days Jesus's days were prolonged by his resurrection from the dead he said in Revelations 1 and 18 I am he that liveth and was dead but I'm alive forevermore amen and I have the keys of death and of hell what is he saying I overcame listen folks if you're going to know the death you got to know the rest of the story. There's a lot of folks that still got him hanging on the cross, but he's not on the cross, folks. He's alive and he's victorious and he's coming back again. I'm telling you, if you're going to do it, you better do it right. Tell the whole story. Yeah. It says, Jesus shall see his seed. Go back to Isaiah 53 10, boo. He said, Jesus shall see his seed. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's his descendants. Jesus had no physical descendants. He wasn't married, despite what some people would tell you. He wasn't homosexual, despite what some other people would tell you. Amen. Come on. Now, he had no physical descendants, but Jesus had plenty of descendants. Spiritual descendants. You and I, a big brother, he, he's our big brother. We're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Oh, my Lord. I'm telling you, he's got plenty of descendants. Every person who places their faith and trust in Jesus is a descendant of Jesus who has the same hope of eternal life. He said, I now live that you may live also. I'm telling you, folks, he wants us to live. I know what I told, told you last week in John 10, 10. He said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He don't want you to just live. He don't want you to just have abundant life, but he wants it to be more abundant. God wants you to overcome. And if you're going to preach the death, you've got to preach the resurrection. And if you're going to preach the resurrection, there is eternal life. Verse 11, look what it says. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Let me remind you what Romans 5, 1 says. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 said he'll justify them. I know y'all heard me say it, but I just want to say it for context because it just makes me shout a little bit. It's just if I'd never sinned. Break that word down. Thank God for justification. Thank God that the law had me bound. The law had me cursed. I should be dead, but I've been justified through, through God by the Lord Jesus Christ. He, Paul said in Romans 5, I've been justified because of what Jesus Christ did. I stand rightly with God. It wasn't because I did it. It wasn't because you did it. It was because Jesus did it and it puts us in right standing with God thank God for justification because of what Jesus did on the cross whoever's placed their life in him faith through faith in Christ has eternal life millions of people have been justified including if all not most of you in this room at one point or another you've been justified the sin and the iniquity that was on your life God washed it away never to be remembered anymore I should have, some of you should have jumped up and shouted right there. I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you. you, you, you see, that this, this is a problem in the American church. We, we think that we, we deserve what we got. No, we didn't get what we deserved. 
You know, we sit back like, oh, well, yeah, he saved me. No, folks, let me just tell you, he saved you. You were on your way to hell. You were dead in your sin. You didn't know what living was all about. But Jesus came by, intercepted your life, and said, I want to set you on a new course. And he washed you and made you clean. I don't know about you, but there's been times I've been dirty. And I thank God for a good old shower. I thank God I got Irish Spring clean. And God, uh, I was able to wash that dirt off me, and it felt good. But the day that Jesus saved me, and wash those sins away in my life. It was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. And don't get upset with me if I get a little bit excited. Don't get upset with me if I kick my feet around a little bit. I'm telling you, Jesus set me free. Thank God I'm not bound. Thank God I died to him. Thank God I'm a new creature. Thank God God has done it in my life. I've been justified. You can remind me of all the bad I did. The world can remind me of all the bad I did. But it's just if I'd never done it. I can tell you stories of stuff I got myself into. But when God looks at it, it's just as if I'd never done it. Thank God I've been justified. Jesus has every reason to be satisfied with the wonderful redemption he's wrought so many. Verse 12. Verse 12. I'm ready. He said, therefore, will I divide him a portion with the great. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. There's nobody like him, folks. There's nobody like him. He's been divided with a portion with the great. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 puts it best, I do believe. The Bible tells us, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and at the tongue that ever confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm telling you, we're coming to the Lord's table and we're coming to preach and we're still coming to proclaim his death but thank God he died but thank God he resurrected thank God he's coming back again thank God I'm telling you folks it's something to get excited about that Jesus Christ lives he lives he lives how do I know because he lives within my soul thank God for the resurrection thank God for eternal life thank God for salvation justification thank God for his glorious blessing you're going to preach his death, preach his rejection, preach his bearing of my sin, preach his substitution, preach his burial, but preach his resurrection. Folks, I'm telling you, he did it so that you and I could live. I don't know what you've been through over the last several days or weeks, but mine have been rough. Fighting physical issues. Mental issues, emotional issues, spiritual issues, it's been a battle. But I've come to this one conclusion. I can put it all in Him, and I can abide in Him, and all that stuff that has troubled me. All that stuff I'm telling you can be done away with because of the substitutionary death that Jesus Christ paid on my behalf that I could have freedom and I could have life and I can be renewed and I can be revived. I'm telling you folks, revival can begin this Sunday. We don't have to wait for Brother Gibson to come next Sunday, but God can begin to do a revival in your heart today and He can say, listen, if you'll just get back to what I did for you and begin to praise me for how good I've been to you, I'm telling you, I can spark something inside of you like you've never seen before. God, I feel it in this house today. Would you stand all across this house? Oh, my Lord. Hey, may miss you. Don't ever forget the sacrifice. Don't ever forget the cause. Don't ever forget that I am the one that brought you out. Don't ever forget I am the one that took your place. 
Don't ever forget how good I've been to you. You ought to praise me. You ought to worship me. I didn't give you what you deserved. I love you. I love you more than you could ever imagine. I am the Lord your God. And I will bring you out. I will touch you. I will heal you. I will deliver you if you'll just call upon me today. If you'll worship me and praise me and exalt me, I'll do in your life what you didn't think could be done. I'm still able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Just worship me today and see if I'm not the Lord your God. Oh, my Oh, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. I worship you today, Father. I worship you today, God. I praise your holy name. You are my God. You are my God. You are my God. There is no one greater than you. You are my God, Lord. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. Woo. Oh, Lord. Would you stand across this sanctuary if you're not already standing? Would you just lift your hands up? I want you to sing that bridge. I want you just to worship it for just a moment. Come on. It's wonderful. Beautiful. Glorious. Come on, worship him. Restless in every way. Wonderful. Beautiful, glorious. Come on, it's matchless. Matchless in every way, wonderful. Come on, worship him. Beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way, wonderful. Beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. Beautiful, Come on, love glorious, glorious, matchless. matchless in every way, wonderful. If you don't thank him for anything beautiful, else, thank him for the fact glorious, that he saved you. His blood has washed you and made you clean. If you're here today and you've got sin in your life, just lift your hands and begin to confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Ask him to wash you. Ask him to make you clean. If you're here today and you've got things that bind you, as Ashley's brought hers to the altar, would you just lay it and confess it to him? Give it unto him and say, Lord, you take it. It's not mine. You bore my griefs. You carried my sorrows. <laughs> if you're stressed out over stuff today, don't get stressed any longer. Abide and set your affection on things above in heaven and earth, not things on the earth. Let God take care of it. He bore it, folks. He carried it. Come on, let him have it today. If you've got problems going in your home, give it to God. If you've been having a fight with your wife or your husband, give it to God. Give it to Him. Let Him fix it for you. If the children have gone wayward, give them to Him. Let God handle it today. He's a wonderful God. He's a beautiful God. He's a glorious God. He's a matchless God in every way. In every way. Come on, worship Him. Matchless. <laughs> There's no God like our God. In your own way, just begin to declare it to Him. Proclaim His death. Proclaim His burial. Proclaim his resurrection. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're matchless. God, you're a good God. Wonderful. Beautiful. Almighty God. Jesus. Matchless in every way. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, thank him, folks. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you. Come on, open your mouth and thank him, would you? Come on, don't worry about what anybody might think about you right now. Just thank him. If you're thankful for what he did for you, would you just open up your mouth and thank him? You ain't got to be real loud. Just thank him. Just thank him. Open your mouth and thank him. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. From a grateful heart, God, I thank you. I can never thank you enough. You've been so good. Thank you for dying a substitutionary death for me. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. God, I praise your holy name today. Praise your holy name, Jesus. 
I worship you today, God. I worship you today, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name, Jesus. Praise your holy name, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got, I, got, I got to share some scripture with you, and then I'm going to dismiss, okay? I, I, want, I want to leave you with this scripture because I, I, want, I want everybody, if you can, if, you, if it is humanly possible for you to be back tonight, we're going to share in communion. We've not done this in a while. We're getting ready to go in revival. Revival starts next Sunday. And I want, I want us to come back tonight, and I want, I want you to partake of communion as a family come together in the bonds of unity and love remembering what Jesus did for you and how he paid that sacrifice but I also want to share with you a warning as Paul warned the Corinthian church about partaking of the Lord's Supper and I want you to dwell on this tonight uh, this afternoon and come back tonight prayed up ready to receive and worship and magnify God for the sacrifices of his death I read you those scriptures about as often as you do it you do it in me and you show the Lord's death till he comes. But I want to read the remainder of that chapter. It said, Whos Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. None of us are worthy, folks. Not in of ourselves. But none of us are worthy. But what he's saying is, if you know that there is unconfessed sin in your life, don't do this. There are things in your life that you've not committed to him. Don't partake. But today, I want you to take time and I want you to pray and seek the face of God and ask God is there something in me God is is there something because if you do it unworthily he said you shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord verse 28 says but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body don't partake if you know you got sin deal with that sin this afternoon and be able to come in and partake of this in, in good fellowship he said if you do this unworthily for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep or dead for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world wherefore my brethren when you come together to eat tarry one for another if any man hunger let him eat at home that you come not together unto condemnation the rest I will set in order when I come 1 Corinthians 11, if you need to go back and read through it and take some time to pray this afternoon, get alone with God, ask God to search your heart, examine yourself. When we come back tonight, I really believe that some things could happen in somebody's life. I'm telling you, there's something about the blood. If we recognize and show the Lord's death, the blood and the body of Christ, I'm telling you, it, 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 it can bring healing, it can bring deliverance. I, I just showed you through Isaiah 53 why he suffered what he suffered. And hopefully, some way, somehow, partaking of the Lord's Supper tonight would have a new meaning to you to understand. If it's not, maybe not a new meaning, but a, a renewed meaning. That a man died, his body was broken, his blood was spilled out so that you could have life. But he, he cautions us not to do it unworthily because you bring damnation upon yourself. Search your heart, examine yourself. Don't judge yourself. Don't just look at yourself and say, you know what? I, I think I'm good. Don't, don't assume. Spend some time with God. And the conviction of the Spirit comes, deal with it. If there's issues between you and somebody else, what I preached about other, hit it right because Christ forgave you. Deal with those things and take the time today to get those things right and let's come back tonight. We're not just participating in a sacrament of the, of the church. He said as often as you do it, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. You're signifying, Lord, your body was broken for me. Your blood was spilled for me. And I could have life. And I could have life. 
Father, I thank you for the reminder today. You are wonderful, you are beautiful, you are glorious, you are matchless. God, I pray tonight as we come back together, I pray, God, that your will be done. Lord, you know who will be here. You'll know who will not be here. You know maybe some that's already determined their mind not to be here tonight. God, I just pray that they would come and preach this message with me, the greatest story ever told. God, that we would come back tonight without saying a word to show forth the Lord's death till he comes. Keep us safe. Keep us in your care. All that we do, all that we say, God, that you might receive the glory and the honor. We'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.